with it. They're all just pleasant and good. And, and uh, so I, he said, you think you could have hit a record on this group? And I said, I could if I had a hit song. Amen. And so he said, well, uh, whose responsibility is that? I said, well, it's the producers. So uh, I came back home and called George Jackson and said, George, I've got this group that I want to cut, and I want to, I want to cut them like the Jackson Five, who's taking over the nation and the world. And I think the reason they're taking it over is because uh, there's nobody white that can do anything that funky or that good <clears throat> for the kids to relate to. And I believe if we'll find a white group that can do that kind of stuff, <clears throat> we'll, we'll really do well. And so I said, write me something like the Jackson Five, so one, two, three, or one of those things that are happening. And a week later, George brought a brought a demo down and uh, I played it to him, and uh, we cut it. And I sent it to Mike Kerb, the president of MGM, and he said, uh, "Rick, I'm gonna put 75 percent of the energy of my whole label behind this group and this record." He said, "I think it's a monster." Of course, the rest was history. Then we broke Donnie off and made him a separate act, and I did "Go Away, Little Girl." And, Puppy loves, and you know that the little bit of guys, mm -hmm. but I kept them as a group and him as an extra. Now you finally that carries you through the seventies, all that pop, big pop stuff. You were producer of the year and Billboard and everything. But then in the eighties, you finally get around to getting back to country. Yeah. And <clears throat> Jerry Reed comes down here and cuts hits and the Gavin and the G. Shepherd. But the yeah, outstanding yeah. story is the homegrown one, and that's Shenandoah. Uh, tell me their story. Did they knock on your door? Uh, not exactly. The, the guitar player, Shenandoah, I had heard about him through a disc jockey in Ohio. I think it was Davenport, Iowa, or up there in that quite a tri city thing that they've got. Uh, the disc jockey called me and said, This guy can really play guitar, and is any place down there for him to play sessions, and blah, blah, blah. I sent him a newspaper with all kinds of articles on it. And I said, send me a tape. So he sent me a tape of his plan. And it was Jim Seals. And uh, the tape had on a country ball, which was later to become a big hit with uh, Ricky Skaggs. Ricky Skaggs, thank you. Uh, and I had never heard a guitar player that played that much guitar that wasn't from in the business and what people weren't using. So I called him and he said, yeah, I'd love to come down. And I said, well, I'll move you down here and pay for your moving if you move your family down here and we'll just make a session player. So he came down, and then one of the guys that wrote for me, his brother, played drums, Mike, and, and, and Mark, the lead singer, they, they were playing a beer joint up the street for me. And so I would hear about them from time to time, and so I went up to hear them and, and heard them at the little place they were playing. I was just, I was, I, I was knocked out. So I said, I want to, I want to, I want to cut a country group out, a, a country Beatles of sorts. I don't want to be this hard country, so I want to be just a step above, you know, the old, the old country. And so uh, we went in and uh, I signed them and got with Rick Lockton, who was the head of uh, CBS at the time, and now it's Sony. And he flipped that over and signed them to the label. I made a label deal with him, and not a label deal, but a production deal, and I was doing it. So, Walt Aldrich and Robert Byrne, two writers for me, uh, and Mac McAnally, they came up with a theory, why don't you guys all find an act piece and we'll make a production deal, and I presented the driver, and he bought it. So, we're off the races. Anyhow, the first album fell on space, because we didn't know, we didn't find our way, what, what they did to it, and what, what people would buy them to it. Second album, we uh, the first album sounded like a conglomerate. It really sounded like five producers produced the album. It was so much different stuff and it had no continuity and no no thread to hold it together. But the second album we nailed it and uh, we began to hunt songs really hard in Nashville with all the publishers and all over the country and send out letters and, and uh, we, we did a thing called Mama Knows, which was the first hit. No. She doesn't cry anymore, was the first hit. It wasn't a huge hit, but then Mama Nose broke the ice and was top ten. 
then we had seven of them one by the same as in a row. And uh, they were they were all from here and they were just good guys, you know. Great actors. Yeah, great actors. Through the nineties the publishing company sort of had most of the attention. But you the studio is still active you're active today. Uh, yeah. as we speak we're, we're missing a session. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to be in the studio now. Uh, I'm late. <laughs> We, uh, yeah, this, the, the publishing company in the early days was not, in my mind, important enough. I didn't take enough interest in it. It was, uh, uh, all the old songs were, were black songs because I was an all black artist. And of course I had a black group of writers out of Memphis, Tennessee, and some here. It was headed up by George Jackson. And uh, I, never, I never paid much attention to it. It was just, Jerry uh, Wexler told me one time, said, Rick, if you want to be a great, big, big time producer of black music, you need to sign some black songwriters because black nobody can write a black song like a black man. And I said, yeah, I agree with you. So I, I took that seriously and went to Memphis and, and, and got with George when we got about 15 some would be songwriters, and some were songwriters, but they, we had some that were there and some that were comers and were going to be five years from later, you know. But we had three or four front line, me and George being the big guy. And uh, so with that crew of songwriters, I just kind of used that to get songs for Pickett, for Clarence Carter, for Aretha, and the people, the, the artists, they were the black artists that I was doing. And when that, uh, when that kind of music kind of began to peter out, and uh, uh, I had no use for, for songwriters that come. And of course, at this time, music was changing again. You know, every five years, basically, the whole trend changes. And uh, so I've gone through uh, a lot of that, but, but the country stuff was a breeze to me, because I was, I was living on the road, living red ass from LA to New York, from Muscles from Huntsville to LA and back. And I was burning the candle basically at both ends, and I was doing 14 acts, 14 hours a year. And I had a label and I had five promotion men. And I and I became basically a regular executive. And I, one day I woke up and said, you know, I'm not doing what I do best, which is produce records. I don't even get in the studio. I have no time to get in the studio anymore. I'm just making deals, writing, arguing with lawyers, and trying to run the label to make sure this guy's promoting that. And he pressed up 5,000 albums and blah, blah, blah. And there's no product in the market in New Orleans and blah, blah, that. So I just found myself just, just torn. So I, just, I called up Mike Stewart, who was president of uh, United Artists. So I went out on a deal. He said, uh, you're crazy. You know, if, uh, if I let you out of the deal, I'll lose my job. And because I had to go before the board of directors at, at, uh, with my company to get this deal clear. And I said, well, I'll give you all the money back. And he said, no, I don't, I don't want that. I, I want you to stay with us. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't. I, I, I want out of it. It's just, I'm not happy. And so I got out of it. I said, but I'll, I'll produce you a hit ad. I'll, hit, I'll produce a hit for you. He said, no, oh, Rick, get out of here with that crap. You, you know, um, we got this deal and you, you're backing out on it. And, and I said, I've got this ad, Paul Anka, I'll produce you a big hit on him. He said, man, I hate Paul Anka. <laughs> said that little egotistical here, blah, blah. And, and he said, I worked with him in New York at the Buff Cotton Club or something. And he had all kinds of bad and so anyhow, three months later, we had a record called You Have My Baby, which was number one three weeks in a row from the pop charts, and it sold about five million singles. And he called me up to thank me. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think you succeeded? I mean, all, all, all odds were that a place called Muscle Shoals in the middle of nowhere, a guy with no formal training in music, I mean, everything. Thing seems to not the, the, the pieces don't add up. What 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 was the secret ingredient do you think that allowed you to succeed? 
so many others did not. Yeah. Mean. Well, I really think I've never thought that I, I was terribly talented. Uh, I think the thing that helped me more than anything else is uh, uh, just a strong desire to win and never say never, and never quit. And I've always had a saying, and people don't like it in our industry, but it's called, I used to say, it's called taking names and kicking asses. Yeah. That's, uh, that's basically how I did it. Just claw and I've always believed it. If the other man works eight hours a day at it and I work 16, I'm going to eat his lunch in a couple of years. He'll be out of business. And I'll wipe him out. I still believe that. And I've always used that theory. And so, where I might have not had the greatest talents in the world, uh, I think the fact that I worked so hard and was so determined and was willing to make the big sacrifices, uh, I think that was the difference. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who made Muscle Shoals, what it is. We're